Well, I want you to turn with me to your, in your Bibles to the second book of Timothy, 2 Timothy. And I'm just gonna use this to spring into what I wanna talk about. Um, after we look into 2 Timothy, we're gonna jump into Acts chapter 16. But 2 Timothy chapter three is where we're gonna start off tonight. Um, a very familiar portion of scripture, I'm sure, to most every one of you. And as we do stand for the reading of the word, you can stand at home as well. We appreciate that to honor the Lord's word. 2 Timothy chapter three, verses one through five. The Bible says this, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Paul said, from such, turn away. Well, I don't know about you, but I believe that we're living in the last days and I believe that the disciples felt the same way after Jesus went up and the Holy Spirit came down. They believed that they were gonna see Jesus return in their day. Obviously, we know that hasn't happened, but every day that goes by, we get closer and closer to the return of Christ. And so tonight, I just wanna preach to you for a few moments on this thought, a Christian's duty in difficult times. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Well, we know that the word perilous is the Greek word kalepos, which means difficult or dangerous. And I know that I'm not necessarily telling you anything that you don't already know when I say that we are living in dark, dangerous, and difficult times in our country and in our world. We're living in difficult times, a difficult situations. Again, perilous simply means difficult or dangerous but tonight, however, I don't want to focus on the dark times, but I want us to focus on what is our duty in these dark times? What is our duty through these perilous times as Christians, as believers, as the children of God? Well, in order to receive more clarity on this question, I want us to take a look at how the Apostle Paul and Silas dealt with a difficult time in their life in the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 24. The Bible says this, that when her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans, to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. And receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in stocks." Now, what was going on here is Paul and Silas were simply going throughout the region preaching Christ, teaching in the name of Jesus, sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ has come into this world to save sinners, of which Paul said, I am chief. And all they were doing was going through, trying to do good and spreading the word of God. Of course, this young lady was following them, crying out, these are the, the ministers or the preachers of the most high God. And finally, after several days, Paul had gotten tired of this, knowing what was really going on. She was full of a devil. And he turned around and he rebuked that devil and cast it out of her. And the Bible says immediately the devil left her. And the thing problem was is that those who were getting gain from her because she was able to tell future events, she was a fortune teller, if you will, they saw that their ability to get something from her was lost. You see, that's what disturbed them. That's what angered them, is that Paul and Silas cast uh, away their hope of gain. You know, sometimes in our life and in our world, sometimes people are gonna be angry with you if they see that your lifestyle somehow in their own mindset adversely affects 
their lifestyle. These men didn't care about the health and the well-being of this girl, for all they cared about was lining their pockets with what she could do for them. I don't know if you know anybody like that, but we've got a lot of people in this world that that's all they're out for is what can it do for me? Obviously, we have had situations spring up in our own lives recently that have affected our normal routine. We've had things come in that have, that have changed the way that we look at things, changed the way that we, we walk about this, this land, changed the way that we go to the store, maybe don't go to the store or go to work or don't go to work. There's a lot of changes that have come to us these last several weeks. But what do we do during these times of isolation and social distancing? How do we handle such a time when we have never seen before? What role do we play if we play any role at all? But in order to answer that, I want us to read on. You see, because Paul and Silas, just by simply preaching the word of God and teaching the word of God, and these men losing their ability to gain money out of this woman's plight, had them beaten and cast into prison. Now, in our isolation, I don't think we're at such a serious time that we've been beaten and put into prison. Praise the Lord for that. But we're in times, I think, that a lot of people are wondering, okay, God, what's happening? What's going on? Some people may even be going, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to have this come down upon me? Some, and we want to be very sensitive to this in, in your life, some may have already lost their job. Some may be dealing and struggling financially already just after a few weeks. And part of that, you know, we, we've we feel and we're praying for you and we're, we're reaching out to God on your behalf and ours as well. But we also know that in just such a short period of time that these things that we seemingly put our trust in can be gone and can be taken away from us. So what do we do during these times? Well, look at what Paul and Silas did when they face a similar situation. Obviously, their situation was much worse. But verse 25 says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. The King James says, and the prisoners heard them. You know, when you're going through a difficult time, do people see you continue to worship the Lord? Do they see you continue to pray? Do they see you continue to reach out to God, or do they see you do just as they do? wringing their hands, wondering, what am I going to do now? Lord, I thought you had my back. Lord, I thought you were watching out for me. Lord, what's going on? You see, Paul and Silas began to pray. So principle number one, what I want you to do in this dark time right now is I want you to pray to God. You see, you know I'm a simple preacher, and I don't mean that as a slight to myself. I just mean that in the simple fact that I just try to keep things as real as I can. I just need to know what do I need to know. I need to know what do I need to do. Just tell me what I got to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And the first thing that we need to understand is we've got to pray. Prayer is the most sacred and valuable weapon of the Christian. If you do not have prayer or you do not pray, then you can rest assured that you will not win the battles that you face. It's an assurity. You see, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul said you need to pray without ceasing. Now, hopefully you know that doesn't mean that you can't do anything else but pray. It doesn't mean that all we do is lock ourselves in a closet 24-7 and pray. What Paul was talking about is that we ought to always be in a mind to pray. Can I tell you that there are times in my life that I've not been in a mind to pray? I know that there are times in my life when I've gone through a struggle and my wife will turn to me and she'll say, honey, we need to pray. And I said, I know, you're right. And she says, will you pray? And I have to admit to you, there are times that I, I'm not ready to pray because I'm frustrated, I'm struggling, I'm trying to work through it. And I've had to tell her from time to time, honey, I, will you pray? You know, I've seen God do some great things through a prayerful wife. I've seen God's do great, God do great things in our lives simply because my wife, I believe, prays without ceasing. And that's what God desires for each one of us is for us to pray without ceasing, always being in a mind to pray. The great prayer warrior, Ian e. Bounds, he said this, four things let us always keep in mind. God hears prayer. God heeds prayer. God answers prayer. And God delivers by prayer. Church, it's imperative that you pray. 
It's imperative. You always ought to pray, but especially in times like this, the church needs to be praying. You know, whenever God, you can look through the word of God, whenever situations like this happen, whether God brings it or it's just a, a happenstance of life, you know, things still happen. Bad things still happen to good people. And it doesn't mean that God brought it on, but there's always a couple of things that God wants to do through difficult times. One, he wants the church to continue to purify itself more, and he wants the world to turn to him. God's desire is to see people to repent. God's desire is to see people to turn to him. But Ian Bounds went on to say, and hundreds of quotes, you can look them up, but he said this, he said, prayer honors God, it acknowledges his being, it exalts his power, and it adores his providence and secures his aid. I don't know about you, but I need God's help. I need the help of God. How am I gonna get that? I'm not gonna get it just by hoping he helps me. I'm not gonna get it just by believing what somebody else says. I gotta pray, and I gotta seek the face of God. You see, nothing is hopeless to prayer because nothing is hopeless to God. Only divine praying can operate divine promises or carry out divine purposes. Get in your closet and pray. Get on your face before God and pray. Get in your room before God and pray. Wherever you go, pray. Seek the face of God. Call upon him today. Trouble and prayer are closely related. Trouble often drives men to God in prayer while prayer is but the voice of men in trouble. I don't know about you, but there's been troubles going on. There's been problems, there's been struggles, there's been trials, but I want you to know the church is praying. I want you to know people are praying. I want you to know God is listening. God hears the prayers of his people. It's a promise in his word. He hears prayer and he answers prayer. Paul and Silas, in the midst of that situation, they prayed, but they didn't just pray. They also, principle number two, they, they praised God. They praised God. You see, it's not just enough to pray, but you need to give God adoration. You need to adore him. Verse 25 again says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. You see, the most striking thing about Paul and Silas in these scriptures is that they never let the darkness and the difficulties defeat them. That even in the midst of their trials, they were able to pray to and to praise God. How about you? How about me? I've already admitted to you, there were times that I faced some difficulties in my life that I didn't know how to pray, but I can assure you there were times, and as a matter of fact, it was the most difficult time I've ever faced in my life in 2009, and I remember where I was, and I went out into the middle of this open field, and I fell down on my face before God, and I said, God, I've been waiting all day to get before you. I mean, you want to talk about getting troubled. This was a situation in my life. My whole family was going through it. We were troubled. We were distressed. And I couldn't wait to get in to the presence of God. You see, as Christians, we cannot allow the difficulties of our day to distract us from the power of our purpose and our calling. If and when we become distracted by the difficulties of life, we will then cease to be effective and people will die because of it. I mean, you think about that. You think that, that might sound pretty harsh, right? But you think about a paramedic. You think about a fireman. If they get so caught up and distracted about this trouble and the circumstance that is going on around them, I mean, I can't begin to imagine some of the things that they have to witness, some of the things that they have to work through in and of their own selves. They're still human beings. They're still people. They have families. They have children, and they have to go to accidents, so they have to go into to burning houses and to rescue people and to save people and to tell people maybe their loved one has passed on. But if they get caught up in the circumstances and they get caught up in the situation that is going on, people can die. There's been times uh, that people have seen these firemen come in or these paramedics come in and they've been yelling at them, why aren't you hurrying? Why aren't you rushing around? Why it's taking you so long? See, one of the first rules that they are taught is that they have to go into a situation that is already escalated and know how to bring that escalation down. They've got to keep their heads about them. They've got to keep cool under the midst of trouble and trial. They've got to keep cool when everything else is spinning out of control and everyone else is losing their minds. When they're coming in as a first responder, they've got to keep their head about them because they want to de-escalate the problem. 
You think about it, if they begin to come in and they're screaming and they're carrying on and they're yelling and they're running like everybody else, this escalation problem that's here is now gonna go to here. Because the person that's come in to help is just as freaked out and worried as I am. That's not gonna help me. You see, as a minister of God, as a Christian, you're a first responder sometimes in people's lives. And if you've not been in prayer and you've not been in praise, you're not gonna be ready to help those people who are in a situation where they're fighting literally for their lives. And because Christians haven't been in a position of prayer and they haven't been in a position of praise, people have died because of that. I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on you. I'm trying to remind you, what is our responsibility in times like this? Church, I've got to pray. Pastor Mark's got to pray. I've got to praise God. Pastor Mark's got to praise God. We can't just willy-nilly walk in. Well, I've been called of God, so he's just going to give me what I need. No, God's asked us to pray and to praise him even in the midst of a dark time. You see, don't let what is happening to you distract you from praising the God who lives in you and being a light to those around you. You've been called to be a light. And the great thing about it is it's not your light. It's not my light. There's no, there's no pressure there. It's just letting the light of Jesus shine through you. It's letting the light of the glorious gospel that is hidden to those that are in darkness shine unto them. How is it gonna shine if you've not been in prayer? How's it gonna shine if you've not been adoring the Lord? I'm not saying it's easy, church. I'm not claiming it's easy, but it's necessary. First Peter chapter five, verses eight and nine, Peter says this, he says, be sober-minded, be alert, for your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion. What is he doing? He's looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him firm in the faith knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. I want you to know you're not in this thing alone. There are others that are experiencing the same thing you are, maybe worse. There are others that are going through some situations right now that, that would probably make your skin crawl, my skin crawl. They're dealing with situations that we can't only imagine. I'm not saying that to lighten your situation. I'm just saying you're not alone. You're not the only one going through it. And so Paul is telling us, or Peter is telling us, you've got to be sober. You've got to be awake. You've got to understand that the devil is trying to destroy you. And he's trying to destroy those around you. He does that by isolation. Oh, what a perfect time for us to be in isolation when this quote-unquote pandemic is running rampant on the earth. And now we have to be forced into isolation. You can't tell me that this isn't a devil plan, that this isn't Satan's scheme to try to snuff out the word of God, to try to snuff out those who maybe are just playing church. But I want you to understand something tonight, that there have been reports of people who have come back to the Lord. They've claimed, I've just been playing church, but I'm not doing it anymore. They've given their life back to the Lord. There's been people People who didn't know the Lord, who've given their life to God. We had a report just the other day that somebody gave their heart to the Lord through the live stream. Praise God. God is working. God is moving. God is counting on us. God is counting on us. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Principle number three, not only are we to pray, not only are we to praise, but we're called to protect one another. We're called to protect one another. Acts chapter 16, verse 26 through 28. As Paul and Silas were praying, as they were praising, and the prisoners heard them, the Bible says suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out to him in a loud voice and he said, don't harm yourself because we're all here. You see, the thing about this is, is that the jailer knew that if, if these prisoners escaped, then whatever they were in prison for, their sentence was required of him. 
The jailer knew that he was as good as dead if these prisoners were gone, so he might as well finish himself off rather than be handed over to the magistrates, handed over to those who could not only torture him before they kill him, but do so many worse things to him. So he felt like, you know, I just need to end it all. I need to get rid of it now. There are people all over our world that think those same things right now, even tonight under the sound of my voice. There may be some of you who are thinking, you know what, I might as well just get rid of it all. I might as well just end it all. I might as well just take it all because I can't take this anymore. Well, Paul made sure that they knew that no one had left, but that all of the prisoners were there and were accounted for. And Paul did this in order to save the life of the jailer. You see, what is the point of this? God just did a tremendous miracle in Paul and Silas's life. And the tendency of most of us in that situation is to, one, get out of Dodge. Right? You think, you know what? I've just been preaching the word of God. I didn't do anything wrong. I actually cast the devil out of this woman. I try to help this young lady. And what do I get for it? I get, I get trouble. I get, I get ridiculed. I get lied about. I get mocked. I get beaten. I get thrown into prison. And the Bible says not only the, the prison, but the inner prison. The jailer was, was charged that they shouldn't get away. And so in order to keep them from getting away, the Bible says he puts them into the inner prison and he fastens their feet in stocks, and he sets them in a place where they're no, they're, there's no way they're gonna get out. Paul and Silas doesn't let that deter them, but they begin to pray, and they begin to praise. But you see, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I pray that I would do what Paul and Silas do, but you know what? I know me. If I'm not in tune with Christ, if I'm not where God need, where I need to be in God, I'm getting out of that place. I've been, you know, those prison doors open, those things shake, and I'm, a, I'm gone, man. I'm gone. The second thing is, is not only would you get out of Dodge, but in pride, you'd thumb your nose at those who put you into prison, and you'd feel like whatever they get, they deserve. You ever been in a situation like that? Again, I'm not trying to bring, you know, shame upon you. I'm just saying if we're not careful, we can get in a situation to where it's like, you know what, I just want to get out of this situation. I want to get out of this process. I don't want to go through this anymore. This isn't fair. I didn't ask for this. I didn't call for this. to happen. All I was doing was trying to serve God, and this has come down upon me by the hands of these men. But Paul and Silas didn't do that but they held back. You see, Jesus didn't save us so we could focus on escaping and saving our necks, but he saved us to be a help in times of trouble. I want you to know that you can help someone else. You say, well, pastor, who's gonna help me? I want you to know if you'll look to Jesus, if you'll pray, if you'll adore him in praise, and you'll begin to reach out and help your brothers and your sisters, you're gonna see God come through for you in a way that you've never seen it before. You're gonna see God come through you in a way that he's never done it before. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 43, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. You know what minister is just a fancy term for servant. Did you know that? It's just a fancy term for a servant. And whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the son of man shall, or came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Praise the Lord. Philippians chapter two, verse four. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, I know Pastor Mark's been in our midweek uh, services, and he's been talking about headquarters, talking about this battlefield of the mind, this struggle in the mind, this situation in the mind that, guys, if you can begin to get your mind focused right, get your mind focused on the things of God, on the Word of God, when you trust the Word of God, regardless of what your circumstances look like, regardless of what's going on around you, regardless of what the media is saying, guys, it's time to turn off the television to the media Hey, I'm not saying don't be informed, but I'm saying don't allow this world to press you into its fear-mongering mold. We have a God in heaven who knows what we need. We have a God in heaven who is ready to answer your prayer. You've got a God in heaven that when you begin to reach out and help others, he's gonna come through and he's gonna help you. You see, Paul and Silas ministered to the needs and they protected the life of the one who put them in prison. They protected the life of the one who kept them in prison by not allowing him to harm himself. Can you imagine that? 
someone who has beaten you, someone who has ridiculed you, someone who has mocked you, and they put you into prison, and they fasten you in stocks. And then when these prison doors bust open, reaching out and helping him. I know that's not human. That's divine. That's what Jesus did for us. Right, John 3, 17, we know 3, 16, 3, 17. He says that God didn't, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. Jesus didn't come down to ridicule us. Jesus didn't come down and say, oh, let me show you how to do this thing. You always get everything wrong. You can't do anything right. I gotta fix this thing now. No, he came down because he knew we couldn't do it, and he wanted to help us out. He wanted to give us hope. He wanted to give us some good news. And that's the fourth and final thing. Mac, if you want to come to the piano, I'm going to close. Principle number four, not only do we need to pray, not only do we need to praise, not only do we need to protect one another, we need to continue in these dark times to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. You see, even in the midst of their trouble, Paul and Silas preached the gospel. Even in the midst of difficult times, we still have the good news. I don't care what's going on around you. I don't care what's happening to you. If you know Jesus, you've still got the good news. You've still got the answer. You still know who holds tomorrow. Even though you may not understand what's happening today, you know that God's already in your tomorrow. God's in next week. God's in next year. God's in your future. God knows what you need. God knows where you are. So what happened to this jailer? What happened? to him after Paul and Silas refused to let him take his own life. Let's look at verse 29 of Acts 16. The Bible says the jailer called for a light. Hallelujah. Guys, there's a world out there that's dying. There's a world out there that's dying, not just from a virus, the coronavirus, but they're dying from a sin virus. They're living in an inner prison that is destroying them, that is wreaking havoc in their life. And they've tried. They've tried to get out of it. They've tried to get better to no avail. Maybe you remember when you were in that position and you tried and you struggled. I believe that somewhere in the deep recesses of their heart, they're crying for a light. The Bible says that you're the light of the world that a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, but it gives light to all that are around. So the jailer, he called for the light, and he rushed in and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he escorted them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord unto him along with everyone in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. And right away, he and all of his family were baptized. And he brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. And he rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Praise God. You see, church, even though there are some things that are happening to you and there are some situations that are going on in your life, if you know Jesus, you've got the good news. And what God is wanting you to know tonight is he's saying, I'm gonna take care of you. I've got this. I've got a hold of you. But I want you to take the light that I've placed with inside of you, and I want you to go tell others around you that maybe don't have this hope, that don't have this assurity, that don't know me, that there's a God in heaven that knows their plight. He sees what they're going through, and all they're looking for is a light. Go be the light in this world. See, if you can somehow find a way in the midst of all that you're, all of your trouble to dig down deep into your soul and still preach the gospel of Christ, I believe that we can still turn this world around for Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know what it means to be in season and out of season? Simply means that in season means when everybody wants to hear it and everybody's ready and everybody's got a Bible study going on. Everybody's like, well, come preach to me and come help me and come tell, tell me about Jesus. That's in season. And out of season is when they're like, I don't want to hear.
what you got to say. I don't care what's going on. I don't, I don't want to hear any of that stuff. You keep preaching the word. You keep telling people about Jesus. There's coming a day that Paul told us, as I read in 2 Timothy, that everybody's going to want to walk away from this thing. But if you'll hold on to it, and you'll continue to preach, and you'll continue to teach, God is faithful to turn the hearts and lives of people. You see, even in the midst of your darkest hour, God can send an earthquake to shake that which was shaking you. God is able to take a bad situation and use it for good if we will not allow the darkness and the difficulties of life to overtake us. I just wanna finish with this one final thought right here. God is able to take any situation, no matter how bleak, and turn it around. Church, I believe that we're ready for a turnaround. I believe that with my, all my heart. And I don't just mean a turnaround of, hey, the virus is gone now. Everybody's free to move about the country. I mean a turnaround in the church. I mean that God is purifying his church because he's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's looking for a church without blemish. He's looking for a church that will do what he's called and asked them to do. He didn't save us to sit on the sidelines. He didn't save us to fold our hands and to fold our arms and say, well, whatever happens to them, they deserve because I want you to understand something. Never forget where you came from. Never forget where you came from. God had to rescue you. God had to rescue me. God's gonna use this situation to turn the church around. I believe it's happening right now. I believe that these, this place is gonna be packed. I believe, as Pastor Mark said, we're gonna get back together on Easter Sunday. We're gonna blow the roof off this place. People are hungry. People are ready. People don't like what's going on in the world, especially Christians. They're not liking this. I'm not liking this. God is calling us to higher ground, for God is ready to turn this thing around. What do we gotta do? Church, keep praying. Church, keep praising. For God's worthy. Protect your brothers, protect your sisters. Look out for those that are around you. Remember what the word said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And keep preaching the gospel. You got the good news. Don't forget it. Hey, in a world full of bad news, at least we still got the good news. We've got the good news. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together real quickly. Father, we just love you so much tonight. Lord, we're so grateful that we can trust you. And Lord, we admit to you, we don't know what's going on. We don't, we don't know exactly how this thing is gonna play out. We don't. But one thing we do know, Lord, it's gonna play out. And Lord, you're gonna come through this thing and you're gonna bring us through and we're gonna be stronger because of it. Because Lord, whenever ever anything comes to, to the church, Lord, it doesn't break it down, it just makes it stronger. And when anything ever comes to this world, Lord, it's for two purposes. It's Lord, really to turn their hearts back to you and really to help them to see that they don't have everything that they thought that they had. That their life isn't as secure as they wanted to believe it was. Lord, I pray right now that we would just fortify ourselves in you. And that, Lord, the church would be the church. Lord, bless my brothers and sisters, Lord. Strengthen them, help them. Lord, I'm not minimizing the fear. I'm not minimizing some of the anxiety that they've felt. I'm not minimizing some of the struggles that they're going through. For, Lord, I know that they're real. Lord, you're bigger than all the struggles. You're bigger than all the trials. And Lord, your word says that after we've been tried, if we'll endure it, Lord, we'll come forth shining as gold tried in the fire. And Lord, I believe when we gather back together on Easter Sunday, Lord, when we gather back together in one mind and in one accord, God, the praise in this place is gonna make this city ring. Lord, help us to be busy about your business. We love you, we honor you, and we magnify you in Jesus' name.
And everybody said, amen.